and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan and my guest today for our discussion is Ujjal Dosanj, Canadian writer, politician, thinker. You, uh, sir, were Premier of British Columbia, BC, um, perhaps the first Indian origin politician to head a Canadian province. Subsequently, uh, again, as part of the Liberal Party, you were Health Minister and a well-known figure in Canadian politics and, I dare say, one of the better known faces in India today when it comes to uh, the Indian diaspora um, uh, at the international level. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Rajasabha TV. Good to be with you. Uh, you have recently authored a book, Journey After Midnight, which in a way um, captures your own life experience. You were born perhaps around the time shortly before India became independent and you migrated in the 60s as a young man and lived your entire life abroad your life, as it were, as an adult in particular, uh, could be read in some ways as a microcosm of the Indian diasporic experience. Uh, uh, although you've had a very unique trajectory in politics, uh, perhaps a very small percentage of Indian migrants uh, enter politics and achieve any degree of success in it. Uh, but let's, let's go back to the 60s. What was the India you left? What are the reasons why you and your family decided that uh, migration was the way forward. Give us a sense of that India in the 60s. Well, India of the 60s was still uh, India of the afterglow of the independence um, and still rising expectations that India was going to go places. But you also knew that the rot had already set in in terms of corruption and Sifarish and all of those bad things. Um, now, you grew up in Punjab, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm right. talking about Punjab. And, and, I, okay. I had not traveled outside of Punjab right, right. Um, before I left um, for England in 1964. And uh, my father was an activist, um, ultimately with the Congress Party from before independence. And my, my nana, my grandfather, maternal grandfather, was a communist that had traveled to the Gurdwara Sudar movement, to Kirti Kasan Party, to CPI. Uh, and including uh, a stint to the Babur Kali movement. Um, and so I had um, experiences with politicians of different shades coming and visiting both households. Um, and I was aware of um, the kind of tensions that existed in India where people wanted more progress, expected more progress, wasn't happening. And, um, and people like me who were then students, I was in um, pre-engineering, um, you know, I felt the um, the sting of poverty. My my family wasn't rich. We, my father and his brother, owned five acres of land in the Sanjkala, and we had about twelve months to feed uh, in a joint family. And um, I wanted to go to a particular college and wasn't allowed to do that um, because of fees. Uh, because of fees and costs, and um, and uh, and I became less interested in science and more interested in politics. Okay. Um, reading the blitz of the time. So back in the day, did you take after your communist grandfather or your congress father? Uh, more, more after my communist grandfather. How about it? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's more rebellion in that. Right, right. And, um, and, uh, um, and I felt um, very constrained um, in the poverty and, <coughs> and, and, and the like. And I um, found a way of getting admission to a college in London um, behind my father's back, um, he found it. Uh, he found out right at the end when the admission came. And scholarship was was uh, was not an issue. No, no, no. Uh. There was uh, it wasn't. Uh, it was just I, I got admission okay. to go, uh, but I needed money to go. Right. Uh, and then uh, he had to. He agreed to scrounge around and found find me a a, a plane fare, which was expensive in those days. Um, and I ended up um, in, in England, uh, didn't go to that school, uh, started working and go, doing night school. So I went from an India which had kind of, um, whose growth had been stunted in a sense. I mean, you know, there was, there was this push and rush of development. But by 63, 64, um, people were beginning to feel disappointed. And now, you, you left in 64? Uh, yeah. Uh, now, some would say, uh, looking back, that you lived through the golden era of the Nehruvian uh, economy, Nehruvian leadership, yet the way it touched your life at the base, yeah. uh, the picture that was presented was not something that you 
the that picture was very just well, encouraging the, for you? Well, the reality was different. Okay. The aspirations were obviously uh, quite different right. from the reality. Right. And Nehru represented those um, aspirations, right. but we knew on right. the ground that it wasn't happening. Yeah. Um, and, and perhaps the sense of idealism I still may have comes from those days, the Nehru days. Right. Uh, well, look, I, I suppose great things were being created at the national level, uh, but you know, in terms of people's day-to-day -day lives, uh, there was still nothing much that was happening. Well, there was sort of, you know, the beginnings of the Green Revolution. I mean, uh, Punjab was very fertile, very productive. Um, I mean, we could live on uh, five acres of land with uh, 250 rupees a month that my father earned as a school teacher um, as well. But, um, but things weren't great. And, um, and uh, I left more uh, out of the constraints and the limit limitations I felt in my personal life vis-a-vis -vis my father and the poverty that we had, um, not necessarily as a rejection of the country, right. um, because I've right. loved India always. And, um, uh, now, you arrive in London as a young man of 18, 19, and you, this is in London or, or some, some other place? No, I, well, I landed in London, but okay. I went to Bedford, Bedford okay. which is about 60 so, miles. So what was your experience? What was the uh, uh, kind of society that you encountered? Was there uh, racism? We know, for example, from the experience of Afro-Caribbean migrants immediately after World War II that there was quite a bit of racism that they encountered. We know that Indians after the great Ugandan exodus also encountered, but what was it? What was England like in the 1960s for a young man like yourself? Well, there wasn't that that much of a population of Indians there at that time. There, there was a smattering of population in places like Birmingham, Bedford, Derby, London. Um, but there weren't hundreds of thousands of Indians right. at that time. Uh, there, was, there was absolutely, there was discrimination. I mean, my own cousin who I joined um, uh, had faced discrimination and he was told to uh, cut his hair and his beard. Uh, to get a job, and uh, he was he was a very secular Sikh, and that turned him into a, a more of a religious right, of Sikh. Course, and yeah. he said, "No way, uh, I'd rather die." And um, and uh, you know, when I um, uh, roamed the streets of Bedford, um, I had experiences which uh, were overtly racist. Uh, Physical threats. Yes, yeah. yes. And um, Bucky, go home, and we were all sort of looked at. The Teddy Boys of the day um, um, would call every. Indian or Pakistani right. Apaki. Right. And the response that you would get from British law enforcement of the day? Um, I don't believe the community was as uh, uh, integrated or as active um, uh, so as to complain about these things. They would go on because they, they were there to make a living, right. get some money, send some money home. Um, there were fights. I mean, there's the Indian Workers Association was beginning to get active and raise issues, but, um, but there were very few activists on the ground in various towns and cities. I, I set up uh, the first um, Indian association in, in Bedford. Uh, I didn't know Mahatma Gandhi had done young something. I, it was Young Indians Association right. in right. Bedford right. to try and deal with some of these issues right. uh, in Bedford. Right. And uh, what led to your decision to move from England to Canada? Well, you know, I had I had done various um, jobs. I was I was a crayon maker. I was a car parts maker. I was. Uh, I so you, you didn't really study actually when you. No, I went okay. to night school. Okay. I went to night school right. uh, because I didn't have the money to go to full time school, right. um, and uh, and I went to night school, did some O levels, and did all of these jobs as a as a train shunter as well. Um, I was. I wanted to go to university, couldn't get admission. There was no resources. I didn't want to ask my cousin who had a family of his own right. to support me. And the admission was somewhat harder um, in those days. I, you know, My qualifications didn't automatically translate into right. admission. Um, and so I was feeling constrained once again in my life. And then, uh, and then Enoch Powell happened. Uh, he made the uh, Rivers, of, Rivers Blood of Blood speech. Blood speech yeah. And uh, that came as I was disenchanted already and I applied um, to um, the Canadian High Commission to get immigration. My aunt was there. I had read about Canada um, and I, uh, they accepted me and I headed off hopefully to a brighter future. So, so when did you arrive in Canada? I mean, which uh, May of 68. 68, okay. Yeah. And uh, this, was, this was to Vancouver? Vancouver. Right. And, 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 and how, how did the entry into politics happen? Because this is a, I mean, I would imagine today we read a lot about Indians in the United States or Canada, 
uh, or even the United Kingdom who are actively involved in politics. And you see a lot of Indian faces. I mean, Nikki Haley is going to be uh, Donald Trump's uh, UN ambassador, UN ambassador yeah. and you know, she was earlier governor. Bobby Jindal is governor. Is, is governor. But uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, to think of a career in politics would have been something quite unusual for an well, Indian migrant. Or, or did politics come to you later? Well, it, it, it really, um, one thing followed another. It wasn't, uh, w there was no plan. I mean, there was no master plan for me to become an MLA. Never had dreamed um, to run. I was uh, working as I got to Canada. I worked in a lumber mill, became a member of the International Woodworkers of America, uh, became a, a sort of a somewhat of a part-time unionized or union organizer as well, and, uh, and became a member of the um, center-left New Democratic Party. Uh, as okay, so you started off at, at, with the NDP? Yes, okay. as a trade unionist, after hanging out with the Maoists of uh, Hardy right. Alpine's variety for about six months. Right. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I had, during that period, um, I worked on, we worked on the issues of equality, discrimination, uh, human rights, uh, janitorial workers' rights, farm workers who had no rights, who were essentially in master-slave relationship. Um, we worked on those issues and domestic workers, the nannies, they had no um, uh, legislative protections either. They were essentially in a master-slave relationship. Right. Those two issues, the nannies issue and the um, farm workers issues, um, we worked on very consistently and systematically for several years. As I was, uh, as I had gone back to uh, full-time education after I had injured my back. Um, and. <clears throat> so, you know, I was an activist first and foremost and a student and once I became a lawyer, I had been a member of the political party and a volunteer for them um, and in 1979, the first election after I became a lawyer, the, um, the constituency kept, came calling and said, look, we, we noticed you rebel rousing and we would like you to consider running for us. Mm -hmm. That's how it began. Right. And, um, and so you, you studied at UBC or Simon Fraser? I did my BA at uh, Simon Fraser and okay. my law at UBC. Okay. Now, uh, you know, British Columbia is an interesting province from 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 an Indian point of view, Absolutely. Uh, because uh, though we, like the pretty much the entire west coast of North America, uh, this was a magnet for Indian and Chinese, uh, yes. by, uh, you know, yes. immigrants going back 100, 150 years, yeah. uh, and. Vancouver was also the scene of the uh, emotionally wrenching uh, Kamagata Maru Absolutely. incident when uh, Indians tried to circumvent uh, laws that the Canadians had made uh, in, order, in, order, in order to exclude Indians by hiring this Japanese ship and of course then yeah. ending up being unable to land and then being forcibly sent back to uh, sent back to India. How, you know, f by the time you get to Canada, late 60s, early 70s, how uh, how much did that history weigh on the minds of Indian migrants? In other words, could you relate uh, in your day-to-day -day lives, in your day-to-day -day experience, elements of that racism and, ex and exclusion that the Canadian state practiced 80 years earlier, or, or had life moved on and this was not so much a, a factor for you? Life, life had changed, but, but there was no escaping the history, particularly for someone like me, because I went into a household, um, my aunt's household, uh, uh, her um, grandfather-in-law was the uh, general secretary of the Gather Party of North America right, right. Um, on the west coast of U.S. and Canada, uh, which was around the same time, active around the same time as the Kamagata Maru. Right. And so there was a treasure trove of historical documents that I, I had access to. Uh, I was very much more conscious than most of, of our history. Uh, but the um, discrimination had uh, obviously diminished. Uh, we now had a right to vote f starting in 1947, which had been taken away from us in 1907. We now had the right to profession and practice, uh, uh, practice in professions like dentistry, medicine, uh, law, engineering, which we didn't have before. And so uh, Canada was uh, more perfect than before, not completely perfect. And uh, so it was a, it was a, a fertile ground for activism to make it better, and which was what uh, people like me were doing um, before uh, we were asked to run. Um, but, you know, it, being on the West Coast, uh, most people, and particularly someone like me, who was very conscious of politics of the independence movement, uh, we were always conscious, always conscious of the Kamagata Maru and the Gata Party, because my own uh, Nana's chacha 
came at the, the call of the Gadda Party in 1914 to India and was yeah. hanged by the British in the Lahore conspiracy right. case. Right. Uh, so uh, the lots of young men at the Kartar Singh Sabha. A lot of lot of people yeah. came back and That's fought right. the British and yeah. paid yeah. with yeah. it for their lives. So that was very close yeah. to my heart. Yeah. Um, and and so for me, politics was uh, elections or anything else was an extension of that kind of politics right. to move uh, the society forward. And when I was asked to run, I thought about it for a while. I had just become a lawyer. I was poor. This um, was in '79, you said, right? Which is '79. I and with NDP, or had you moved to the Liberals by then? No, no, I, I was yeah. still the NDP. NDP okay. yeah, yeah, provincially, I was always NDP. Okay. Um, and um, I had I had married in '73, '72, and uh, I had two children, and the third came on just before the election in '79. But uh, I ran, and I lost that election. Um, the, the main reason I ran was the, uh, the party convinced me that I had this unique experience of working with the farm workers, the janitorial workers, the domestic workers, and I was an immigrant of color, uh, a person who in, whose English, um, English wasn't uh, the first language for me. And they felt that it was important for someone like me to run, and I felt so too, and that's how I came to run and lost the election, of course. Um, and then ran another time 83, ran, um, sat out the 88 election um, because I had been then fighting the extremists uh, around the question of Khalistan uh, for several years um, uh, starting in 84. Uh, that took up uh, essentially a f you know, full time work right. uh, on my part right. as I was practicing law um, and there was violence around that issue. Um, I was the victim of that violence. Um, but sort of we lived through that and then um, finally once again under certain circumstances and uh, persuasions I decided to run again in 91 um, and won and uh, was the Attorney General of the province for four and a half years and uh, the Premier for a year and a half. Right. Uh, but you know when I ran I never thought I'd win. If I won I, I never thought I'd ever be in cabinet. Right let alone the Attorney General or, or the Premier. So from my perspective, politics was always something noble that yeah. you engaged in, not for being something, right. but for doing something. Right, right. You, you, you have, I mean, you come and go in Punjab virtually every year. You have friends, yeah. relatives yeah. here. And I'm sure you're quite familiar with the way politics works in India. Absolutely. Um, you know then that politics is a very expensive business here. If you want to stand for uh, MLA ship or MP ship, you need to mobilize serious cash. Absolutely. What's the scene in BC or Canada? Uh, is it is it can somebody with limited or even no resources contemplate entering electoral politics in Canada? Absolutely. Okay. Um, you can't contribute to your own campaign beyond a certain limit anyway. You can only contribute as much to your own campaign as anybody else can contribute to your campaign, okay. which is um, limited okay. by so law. Th th these are limits to individual contributions. Absolutely. Okay. And, uh, and, and there are no corporate contributions in certain jurisdictions. And most of the money came in hundreds or two hundreds and fifties uh, from various donors, uh, in my case from BC, yeah. but also from all across Canada. And would typically be tabulated and accounted? Would, 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 oh, of would accounts be kept for that sort of thing? Oh, of course. Unlike here where a donation of up to 20,000 rupees, yeah. quote unquote, yeah. Uh, yeah. need not be uh, recorded every, even. Every donation would be recorded except a donation below $10 or okay. something. Uh, and then you'll have an election agent um, candidate agent who would be responsible for, for providing that accountant's uh, account to um, the returning officer and to the electoral officer. Right. And uh, people are prosecuted if there are errors in it. Right. This takes us slightly away from where I thought we would go, but yeah, let nice. me ask you for a one minute question, yeah. a one minute answer. Uh, given the Indian preoccupation with the fight against black money, and clearly there is a link between politics and black money, would you say that uh, the Canadian method of election finance and political expenditure uh, is something that India ought to look at if it's serious about combating the influence of money power in general and black money uh, on politics? Absolutely. I mean, in, in Canada, you can't donate cash more than in tens or twenties right. uh, individually. And um, it has to be by um, a credit card or by um, a check. Right. And it has to be registered and reported. Um, and uh, that's by law. Right. Uh, and I think that 
India needs to uh, put a limit on personal contributions right. or corporate contributions um, to elections and uh, make sure that each and every cent is reported. Right. Does it disappoint you when you come back to, uh, when you visit Punjab again, that uh, immigration somehow never stopped? I mean, just as in the 60s, a young man like yourself felt compelled based on his own circumstances and the perception of what was happening in the right. province and the country that your future was in some sense uh, you know, uh, more secure if you went abroad. Right. That, that desire, so you know, that desire to leave uh, has remained pretty much constant. And even today, we hear stories of young men who feel they have no future uh, within within their their environment, who want to get out, who want to leave the country. Uh, does this worry you? Does it disappoint you? Well, it worries me. It disappoints me um, uh, to no end because uh, every third or every second person, young person in in Punjab. I'm aware of Punjab um, is waiting to just get out. Yeah. Um, Often at great personal expense. I mean, yes. nothing has changed yeah. to that extent. And, yeah. and sometimes people die en route. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, very, very disheartening. Um, I mean, some years ago, uh, not to just talk of Punjab, some years ago when I visited here, um, there was a politician who was boasting how India was sending software programmings abro programmers abroad, exporting them which I thought was insulting to India and Indians because here you are a relatively poor country, spend millions of dollars or rupees Train people, exactly. training your own people and you can't uh, deal with them inside the country yeah. and, then, and then you're saying you take pride in exporting them. I mean, I thought that was the height of right. uh, an insult. Right. Uh, turning back to Canada, uh, if you take a long view, I mean, the, the Canada that you encountered in the 60s that you, uh, in a way, uh, first embraced or got to know in the 70s was really quite a different place from what Canada is today. I mean, uh, the, the way in which Canada has embraced multiculturalism, whatever one may think of the concept, but certainly uh, I get the sense that, that migrants from various parts of the world feel much more accepted and embraced in Canada than they would do, say, in Europe uh, or in certain, part, certain parts of the U.S. True. Um, the Canadian attitude towards First Nations uh, today is uh, remarkable if you consider the kind of very, very dodgy treatment that extended even up to the 70s when kids were being Absolutely. taken away and forcibly educated. Absolutely. Uh, uh, what, what accounts for the evolution of Canada as, as a country that uh, today is far more accepting of difference, revels in that difference? I mean, in India, we like to talk of ourselves as unity and diversity. Canada also has embraced that concept. What explains this? Is, is this the struggle of different sections for recognition? Is it just uh, growing awareness among, you know, among white Canadians that this is needed? I think it's a struggle for recognition, uh, obviously. But it's also a, a recognition by the majority that, that if, if you have substantial parts of your society that are less than equal, then society can't really be considered egalitarian. But it's also, you know, some, sometimes human beings make a difference, leaders make a difference. And, and Pearson, that came before the older Trudeau, the elder Trudeau, um, brought in the uh, Canada Pension Plan, the health the, the, um, healthcare, and some of those uh, universal programs that, um, that benefit people and make Canada a more just and, and fairer society. Uh, and then came the elder Trudeau in 1968. I was, in fact, I got to Canada in May. He got elected as prime minister in June of 68, and his first election was in June of 68. And, and, and the vision, his vision uh, was essentially encompassed in the phrase just society. Uh, he wanted to create a more just society. That was his slogan. Um, and I think that, that that was the foundation, and yeah. he opened up the doors to immigration. And that was the foundation of... Uh, a more inclusive uh, uh, society. Right. Uh, and we've continued on that course with uh, a slight fluctuation in the other direction with Mr. Harper. Right. Um, now with the younger Trudeau, right. uh, we are on, on course to enhance that diversity. And, and, what, and, what, and what better advertisement for, uh, for Canada's reputation than the fact that immigration department servers in Canada crashed on the night of, of Trump's Donald Trump's victory. <laughs> uh, Ujjal Dosanjh, we're completely out of time. It's been a great delight to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Good seeing you. Thank you. That wraps up this episode of Indian Standard Time. Do join us again next week with another guest. Thank you for watching.